you've come to the right place. If you're a course creator looking to build more impact, income, and freedom, LMS Cast is the number one podcast for course creators just like you. I'm your guide, Chris Badgett. I'm the co-founder of the most powerful tool for building, selling, and protecting engaging online courses called Lifter LMS. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of LMS Cast. Today we're joined by a special guest, Ryan Levesque. He's the author of a new book called Choose. You may have uh, read his past book called Ask. Ryan is a uh, membership site builder. He's an entrepreneur. He's a marketer. Uh, He's got a strategic mind, which we're really going to dig in today. Ryan, thanks for coming on the show. Chris, it's awesome to be here and I'm excited to dive right in. Cool. Well, I have been listening to you a lot on YouTube and on the podcast wave. So I'm going to make this one a little different and I'm not going to ask you the same stuff. <laughs> so, All right, let's do it. I, I love it. You know, when you do a book launch, you have <laughs> yeah. to do this big media tour and you kind of get tired of hearing yourself answer the same questions over and over again. So I, I love mixing it up. Let's, uh, let's do it. So one of the reasons I really connect with you, I've recently learned we're both, we're probably about the same age. We've got kids at home. Um, the earlier days of figuring out online business were, um, you know, there's a learning curve there and it's kind of stressful at times. And you started getting into the, the orchid care information product. My very first online course, uh, platform was in the organic gardening and permaculture niche. And I started partnering with experts, um, all over the world. And eventually it had me flying to different countries, filming these workshops in the jungle of Costa Rica and stuff like that. And I'm just like, I'm just bringing basic internet marketing to like what's <laughs> going on out here, filming it and digitizing it. And that's really where my journey began as a course creator. But you were also in plants, orchids, and uh, helping them not die, helping people learn about orchids. It's just like permaculture. There's a lot of irrational passion there. Um, Tell us about it. Tell us about the, you know, what it's like working within the gardening niche. You know, it's, it's interesting. It's not, a, it's not a space I ever dreamed that I would get into. You know, I'm one of these people who, when I started my first business, I knew I wanted to do my own thing. I knew I wanted to be my own boss, but I just had no idea what that was. And the thing that was holding me back for such a long time is I felt like I had to find something that was like my life's mission. And so I was like looking like, what is that thing going to be? And I was just kind of soul searching and trying to find it. And it wasn't until I uh, used a strategy, I talk about this in the book, which is to just start with a practice business, to detach yourself from the outcome and focus on using your business as a vehicle to learn the skill of everything required to be a course creator, to build a, a business online. And so I specifically took something that I was dispassionate about, that I had no you know, ties to. And so um, Orchids came about because I'd made a big long list of possible ideas. And uh, I remember um, being in my apartment, I was living in Shanghai at the time. I remember looking around, I had a couple orchids in the apartment. And it was just like one of those like, oh yeah, orchids, write it down on the list. And when I started doing the research, it just kept bubbling up as, as, a, as a thing to pursue. So I um, went into that market, didn't know anything about orchids. Um, you know, now, you know, uh, fast forward to today, so it's like more than 10 years later. Um, we have courses on all the different orchid varieties. I know the difference between dendrobiums and oncidiums and phalaenopsis and paphiopetalum and vandums. And I just, you know, like I know more about orchids than I ever thought I'd ever uh, learn. Um, but um, what I learned along the way is that there are some advantages when you are not an expert in the space that you go into, because as they say, A Zen mind is a beginner's mind. And it allows you to see things that the expert is blind to. It allows you to come into a niche and really ask the dumb questions and have no ego attached to it and ask, why are things like this? Why are people struggling with this? And really allow you to make the customer your focus as opposed to being stuck with the curse of knowledge. So I like to tell people, if you don't feel like you have expertise right now, If you don't feel like you are an expert, in many ways, that can be something you use to your advantage. It certainly was to me and my wife when we uh, launched that business, Orchids Made Easy, a little over 10 years ago. That was awesome. Um, I love that idea of the beginner's mind. I I talked to a lot of course creators, would-be membership site folks, and you know, the usual story is they're trying to monetize their expertise, their knowledge, their experience. But if you come at it with the publisher mindset, like, how did that work for you with that? Did, uh, did you find an expert? And can you tell us how that 
happen or did, did you do the research and create it yourself? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, the first business that we ever started before the Orchid business was in a totally random, tiny, obscure niche market, teaching people how to make jewelry using Scrabble tiles and origami paper, Scrabble tile jewelry something I knew nothing about. It was something my wife introduced me to. And we found this because it was this trend that was just exploding on the website etsy.com at the time. And so my wife saw this and uh, she learned how to make the jewelry and she was the first expert. So she learned how to make the jewelry. We created a tutorial. We created a business called the Scrabble Gal. Um, and the first business was born. Um, when we launched Orchids Made Easy, very similarly, we knew very little about orchids. The, the, my extent of, the extent of my orchid knowledge was I bought a bunch of orchids in China and uh, we killed them all. They all died. <laughs> that was like my experience with orchids. So first product that we ever launched in that business was uh, our book, Orchids Made Easy. The way we created that product is we did a ton of research in the market. And just like you're doing here with this interview, we said, we're not going to write the book that everybody else has written. Instead, we're going to start with the market. We're going to ask them questions to understand what their biggest challenges and struggles are. And then we're going to answer those questions in the book. So instead of assuming that this is what should be included in a book on how to care for orchids, we started with the audience first. And it's kind of where the ask method was first born. My wife, who is uh, an incredible writer, she uh, you know, has a PhD, she's just amazing, wrote the book. I did everything else. So you talk about the hats that you need to wear. I learned, and this is way before uh, even WordPress was really kind of a huge thing. So I learned HTML, I learned CSS, coded our first website, I uh, learned how to write copy, I learned a little bit of graphic design, I did the layout for the book, I learned how to do this in design, like knockoff, I learned Google AdWords, I learned how to do email marketing, I learned all these things, a little bit of tech, like I had to wear all those hats. Um, and uh, that was our first product. Now, second product, we had this problem. The problem was this, at the time I was a 20 something year old kid and we'd created this persona in the market of um, an older gentleman who is the, you know, the voice behind the business. And so we were kind of stuck, like I can't get on camera and teach people about orchids. And at the time, I certainly wasn't comfortable on camera. Like I was weird, I was awkward, I was nervous. Um, so we uh, went to Elance and we uh, found someone who was a retired school teacher who loved orchids and had his own orchid greenhouse. And his name was Chuck. And we worked with Chuck to create our first video course on how to care for orchids. And that sort of opened the door where we began partnering and hiring experts. We hired a woman who had a blog about orchids in New York City, and she was writing about orchids in small spaces. We hired her to write all of our articles on our blog. Uh, we hired a, a, a professional photographer to create a course on how to photograph orchids in the wild. Um, we hired a watercolor artist to create a course with us on how to paint uh, a watercolor uh, uh, paintings of orchids. We hired an expert in hydroponics, you'll appreciate this, uh, to teach people how to grow orchids with what we call the just add water method uh, mm -hmm. hydroponically instead of potting soil. So we ended up usually hiring experts in all these different areas and we adopted that publisher model. How did you do the uh, how'd you how'd you do the cash flow for that? Like, it's if did you give them a revenue share or you had savings to to do that? How did you manage that? It's a great question. So we did we we experimented with a lot of different uh, options. So in the yeah. case of the uh, first video course with Chuck, we paid uh, Chuck and he had a um, a friend who was a videographer. We paid them a few thousand dollars, just lump sum, and then we owned the material thereafter. So we cash flowed it. We we yeah. you know we invested a few thousand dollars. Um, and one of the things that I that I that I teach is the importance of um, the pre-sale. Yeah. I talk about this a little bit in the book. I talk about this in my, in my first book, but the importance of everything that we've ever done, we've sold it before we've built it, right? Yeah. Um, I think this is a big mistake people make is they spend a lot of time building their membership, building their course, um, and they say, all right, I've built this, now I'm going to start selling it. I've always adopted the mindset that we pre-sell whatever it is that we're going to create and always do it with the option. We, create, uh, we build in optionality where we say, listen, we're thinking about creating this thing, if there's enough interest, we're going to go through with it. If you pre-order the thing now, you can get in at an amazing grandfathered price, plus all these bonuses, and you get to help us shape the program. If you're interested, pay here. If it turns out that we don't do the course, we'll refund the money to you. And if there's enough interest, you get in at this amazing steal of a deal. That's kind of been my move in that way. So that's how people always want to know, well, where do you come up with the money to do this? We've always pre-sold what we create and then use that, uh, the funds to, to you know, hire and create the course. So um, those are a few examples. The, the woman in New York, we paid her in a, um, uh, on a per article basis. 
So we did a deal with her where we, she would charge a specific amount for per article and we'd do a batch of like 20 articles. Um, the, um, the orchid photography course, as an example, we actually partnered with the uh, course creator and the structure that we came up with there, which is something I've used elsewhere in my career, is it was a 50-50 partnership with a 50% affiliate commission. And what that meant is this. So uh, if we sold the course to our audience, we would get 50% of the sales as an affiliate. Okay. You also get 50% of the remaining 50% as the product owner. So we would get 75% of the sales. Now, if the course creator, the uh, photographer sold it to his audience, he would get that same 75%. And we found that that model has worked really, really well for co-creating products in a partnership arrangement. Wow, that's, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. On a side note, um, you're obviously what I would call a serial entrepreneur. So like <laughs> course creators, membership folks, like they see opportunity everywhere. You know, you see gaps in the market. You see what can be and tribes you can build and lead and all this stuff. And I don't know the right word. There's a serial entrepreneur. Let's just call it a mono entrepreneur. I know certain course creators like somebody, you know, Jeff Walker, who does the same course over and over again. He's like really focused and that's not one's better than the other, but what advice do you have for other education entrepreneurs out there that are realizing that they have that serial multi interest, you know, uh, personality like you do? You know, well, first of all, I would say I've got a couple of pieces of wisdom that I pass along um, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer it a few different ways. So um, one of the things that uh, I discovered in uh, the research that led to this most recent book, Choose, is I was looking at what was it that was separating um, people who had implemented my previous book and who were successful from those who had failed. I was looking at what were the factors that differentiated um, the major successes from those that failed. And uh, all roads pointed to the same thing. The people who were failing were choosing bad markets. That was the number one thing, and that's what inspired me to write this book. And then in that journey, I discovered that there are four different types of people when it comes to building an online business, four different kind of groups of people, and they are different entrepreneurs, and I call these types the mission-based entrepreneur, passion-based, opportunity-based, and undecided. Now, for me, um, I was an undecided entrepreneur. What I mean by that is I knew I wanted to be my own boss. I knew I wanted to start my own thing, but I had no idea what that would be. Now, not everybody's wired that way. There's some people who are very mission-based. In other words, they've got a mission, a cause that they would die on the hill for, and they want to, that's their thing. Like, that's their life calling. Um, you've got passion-based entrepreneurs who have a love, whether it's permaculture or orchids or playing the guitar or dogs or whatever it may be, and their goal is they want to transform that, that passion into a vocation. And then you have opportunity-based. Opportunity-based entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs in the most classic sense of the word. They're the type of person who like looks around and sees an opportunity and says, how is it that nobody has like built this yet? How is it that no one has created a business around that? And then they pursue that. Um, and so uh, what I'd first say is number one, whichever uh, entrepreneurial type you most identify with, there's not one that is better or worse than the other. It is what it is, but it starts with self-discovery, like know thyself, right? So know who you are and just be okay with that. Um, if you don't have a mission or a passion, there's nothing wrong with you. If you're undecided, there's nothing wrong with you. If you have a passion, you know, go for it. But if you don't, it's okay. Um, so I learned I wasn't someone that had a mission or a passion. I was very much undecided. And what I learned along the way is uh, to fall, to detach myself from the outcome and focus on the process. I learned very quickly that I fell in love with the process of choosing a market asking that market what they needed, creating something to serve that market, getting a feedback loop to see what was I missing, what did I need to improve, and lather, rinse, repeat. Like I really fell in love with that process. That's why I went into 23 different niche markets, doing it over and over again. Um, but one of the things I've learned along the way, if I were to do it all over again, is you know when I first started my business, my, 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 um, my business plan, Chris, was I said, if I go into 20 different niche markets, and build a half a million dollar business in 20 different niche markets, I'm gonna build a $10 million a year empire. That was like my big thing. That's um, diversified. I, I, I did, you know, I, and I did that because my first business, that Scrabble tile jewelry business, was turned out to be just a fad. So we took that business from a few sales to within a few months making $8,000 a month, and the next month it went down to almost nothing. At this point, I'd quit my job. My wife was in grad school. We had, we had burned through our savings. We had that moment where we said, oh crap. And so I never wanted to be in that position. I said, if I diversify that, if the market ever disappears, I'm never going to lose more than 5% of my income. So that was my vision. Now, um, what I learned along the way is that um, people who want to make Scrabble tile jewelry are not into orchids. 
So there's no cross-sell opportunity. People who are into orchids don't want to improve their memory, one of our other businesses. So there's, there's no cross-sell opportunity. So I realized very quickly that that was not a strategy that was going to deliver what I you know, thought it was going to be. So I would, be, um, I would offer um, the advice to anybody who has that itch to jump from thing to thing to thing to think about how these different ideas support one another how you create a rising tide that raises all ships. You create the equation where one plus one equals three. Don't do what I did where one plus one equals 1.5, which is the situation I found myself in with the first few niches that we uh, went into. That's great advice. We're going to get into how to choose the right course to make in a second, but you've got a really generous offer here for your book, which is at choosethebook.com forward slash LMS cast. Tell them what do they get with that? Yeah, so uh, I wanted to do something super special for your audience. And so what I'm going to do is uh, this new book, Choose, it retails for, look at the price right now, $24.99 in the US, $33.99 in Canada. But I'm going to ship any one of your listeners a free hardcover copy of the book any in the wor- anywhere in the world. I just ask that they pay a few dollars shipping and handling. And uh, I- I'm going to also include over $200 in free gifts, including the audiobook. If you're like an audiobook fan like I am, I'm going to hook you up with that. Um, people always want to know when they um, see my book, they, they say, um, all right, so the book reveals um, the criteria you want to look for within a good niche. What are examples of niches? Well, I mentioned I went into 23 different niches. I've had a private list of the niches I would go into next if I had the time. Um, I've decided to give every single one of your listeners that exact list, the 25 niches I would go into in 2019 that check off all the boxes in the book um, for free, plus a whole bunch of other stuff, over $200 in bonuses. Um, go to that link, choose the book.com forward slash LMS cast. I only have a, a, a limited number of copies of it's I'm, I've negotiated this with my publisher to be able to do this. Um, so go ahead and do this, um, you know, while you're listening to this and I'd be happy to hook you up. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, so I see a lot of course creators, unfortunately fail for different reasons. Before we started recording, we talked about the five hats course creators, coaches, and consultants need to wear if they're going to build these types of courses and coaching training sites, memberships. Um, They have to be an entrepreneur, an expert, a teacher, a community builder, and a technologist. Uh, So it's, there's a lot of failure. Unfortunately, I see happening. It's actually the motivation and the passion behind why I started the show I'm, I'm kind of in the technology side, but I like to help people across all the hats, hence the, hence the show. Um, I want to kind of give you a specific example to work with, okay. and then you talk about the five market must-haves uh, okay. of how to choose the right niche or course or topic to, to go after. And I want to just share like a personal example. Okay, uh, sure. So in my organic gardening permaculture, let's just say YouTube channel, like I take some of my best lessons, I put them on YouTube for free. There's a link in the description of the paid course. Um, Those some some of my videos have 20, 30,000 views, but these are like really famous experts in the niche. And, you know, I can work my buns off over here with uh, education entrepreneurs, digital marketers, like membership site people, and, you know, do paid traffic and the view counts are like way lower. Like, so, so the, what I'm, what I, what I guess I'm trying to build a bridge for you to talk about is the, the gardening permaculture niche appears to be much larger than this, like very specific type of education entrepreneur website builder. How does that fit into the market must haves when we choose what to do? Yeah. So, so before I get into market must haves, I want to, I want to address the um, question that you really uh, brought up and it's a really good one, which is around market size right? Like, how do you know if your market size is, is too big, too small? Like, how do you figure that out? And truthfully, that was a question I was really interested in answering as well, because it's a question I get all the time. Is my niche big enough? Is my niche too big? Should I niche down? Should I niche up? And so one of the things that we did, Chris, is we looked at every single one of the 23 niche markets that we've gone into. um, And we measured keyword volume in each of those markets. And we wanted to see, is there a difference between the businesses that were most successful from the ones that were not as successful? And then we extended that research to uh, uh, our clients and our students uh, of, our, of our paid programs. And what we found was very fascinating. We measured the keyword search volume across all these different businesses. And what we found was that every single one of the most successful businesses all fit within this very narrow band. We used Google Trends, the free tool that anybody can use to measure keyword volume. And they all fit within this very narrow band. And every single one of our less successful businesses was either way above 
or below that band. And for literally months, we debated. We said, um, are we going to reveal these keywords? Because it's kind of like, you know, the secret sauce. Like everyone wants to know. And I knew that if we revealed the keywords, we'd be inviting a lot of competition because people would see them and say, okay, cool. These are good markets. I'm going to build a business in this space. So for months, we debated that. And in the end, in the book, we decided to reveal what those keywords are. So anybody can answer that question that you're asking right now, which is um, the market I'm thinking about going into or the idea for my course that I'm thinking about building. Um, is it too broad, too narrow, or is it in this sweet spot? And you can use these benchmark keywords to compare it against your idea. So that's the, that's the first thing. So I would start there to answer that question. Now, related to the five market must-haves, so let's talk about those, which is another test, right? So the book is really a series of tests that you perform in order to determine if your idea is a green light, if it's a yellow light, proceed with caution, or if it's a red light, don't do it. Like start over and come up with something else. So market must-haves, let's talk about them. So there are five things. We'll talk about the uh, permaculture uh, um, uh, market uh, with, with these five market must-haves in mind. So first market must-have is what we call an evergreen market. Evergreen market is a market that was relevant 10 years ago. It'll be relevant 10 years from now. My Scrabble tile jewelry market is not an evergreen market, right? That's a fad. You don't want to go into a market like Scrabble tile jewelry or Beanie Babies or fidget spinners or more recently, I imagine you might have some clients who went into the Bitcoin market. Yep. Remember when everyone was talking about Bitcoin? Yeah. It's like membership sites on Bitcoin and podcasts and everything. 95% yeah. Yeah. of people who went into the Bitcoin market are doing something else now because that's an example of a market that trended and then fell off a cliff. So you want what's called a metronome market, a market that just goes every single year, just humming along. So this um, is like uh, parenting, gardening, uh, relationships, like yes. evergreen. Yeah. Exactly. That list of 25 markets that I mentioned, they all check that first box for anyone who's yeah. interested. But yeah, great examples. Uh, an example I share in the book is newborn photography. <laughs> as long as people are making babies, and yeah. as long as people want to look at those babies, newborn, <laughs> newborn photography is a great niche that's not going away anytime soon. So that's an example of a, an evergreen market. Orchid care, dog training is another one, right? Um, but it's not enough to be in an evergreen market. You also need to be in a market that is not only evergreen, but what we call an enthusiast market. Now, an enthusiast market is different from a problem solution market. There are evergreen markets out there that are problem solution. An example of a problem solution market would be something like uh, wart removal. If you get a wart on your hand or your foot, like warts have been around forever. They're probably not going away anytime soon. But it's a, it's, it's a market where when you solve the problem, you move on. Yeah. You're not signing up for any courses or membership sites or Facebook groups or email lists on wart removal. Like you solve the problem. Number one, it's embarrassing. So you're not talking about it. And then you just move on, right? So that's a problem solution market. Now compare that to something like orchid care or dog training or even organic gardening or permaculture. Yeah. That's an enthusiast market that people remain consumers in that market for years and years and years. And that's what you're looking for. You want a business where you can sell to the same person in the same market, multiple products, as opposed to a market where you have to constantly chase after a new customer. So that's a second must have. Must have number three, and this is the one where we're gonna to start to get in trouble, is you need to solve an urgent problem in the context of this evergreen enthusiast market. What I mean by that is it's not enough to just go into the orchid market. It's not enough to go into the dog training market. You've gotta focus on what is the bleeding neck, urgent problem that people need to solve in that market that gives you this in, it's like your niche doorway. It's your doorway into that person's life. So, so is that like market, for the baby photography, does that mean like, well, my baby's only going to be small for so long. Like I have to capture this while I can, right? It's built in urgency. Yeah. Newborn photography. Remember when you were <laughs> yeah. girls were newborns, right? Remember how brief that window of opportunity was to mm -hmm. capture those precious photographs of you and your you know, wife holding the babies Yep. in that, that precious state. It's like weeks that you have, that's it. And if you miss it, it's gone forever. There's so much urgency built into that market. Now in the dog training market or the dog market, for example, um, you can't go into that market and expect to kill it building a course or a, uh, a membership site on like, you know, uh, doggy mugs or doggy, you know, uh, t-shirts or whatever. Cause nobody wakes up and says, we have to solve this today. Yeah problem that people do have is if you bring a new puppy into your home, potty training your puppy. If you have a puppy that's making a mess on the carpet, on the floor, like that is an urgent problem. In the orchid market, it's all the flowers have fallen off the stem and they want to get their orchid to reflower. 
So people will bring an orchid into their home. They don't know anything about orchids. The orchid's beautiful. It's filled with this spray of blooms. It's absolutely gorgeous. And they go to bed. They wake up the next morning. They flip the lights on in their kitchen. And they wake up to find the orchid to be nothing but a dried up stick. All the blooms in an otherwise healthy looking orchid have just fallen onto the table. And they freak out, go online and say, what did I do wrong? How do I get my orchid to flower again? That's an example of an urgent problem in an evergreen enthusiast market. That's number three. Number four is you want a market that's filled with future problems. Because here's the thing, when you solve that first urgent problem for somebody, you have this opportunity to become their trusted advisor for life. Like toddler photography. Toddler photography, that becomes your family photographer, right? <laughs> so I look at Melissa, who's yeah. photographed our family since my two boys were super young, since my, my, my younger son was a newborn. Um, we get photographs with her every single spring. Yeah. We're a customer of hers for life because we want to capture all these moments. She does an amazing job. And we've tried a whole bunch of other photographers. We love Melissa. Now, it extends beyond that. Melissa is also my photographer for all of our business events. So she's like, you know, become, she's developed into what could have been a one-time several hundred dollar photo shoot to literally a multi-thousand dollar relationship that's now spanned years. Right. So that's what you're looking for is a market where you solve future problems. Orchid market, perfect example. Once you get the orchid to reflower, then it's, my orchid's healthy, but it's, it's the, the roots have spilled over the pot. How do I repot? Once you get it to repot, it's, ah, oh, the potting material is such a mess. Well, how about you ditch the dirt and use the just add water method and grow your orchids hydroponically? Cool. How do I do that? You have these yeah. beautiful orchids and you say, I need a greenhouse. Well, let's teach you how to build your own greenhouse at home to get a place for those orchids. So there are all these future problems that you can solve for someone and that's what you're looking for. Now, the fit, so the permaculture one, I'd be thinking about what future problems exist. What urgent problems do people have in that market? And the fifth and final one, is you want to be in a market that is filled with PWMs, which stands for players with money. You got to remember this. As a course creator, membership site creator, you can't sell to broke people. I have some questions Not around people. that one. I, that's a good <laughs> one. And I do see a lot of, um, it's especially challenging for course creators who are creating their, in the context of pricing, this often comes up. Or yep. if you have a recurring revenue model that includes a coaching package or whatever, um, the kind of some of the general advice is, well, you should go B2B, go to other businesses, but they're still consumers. I, I was wondering if you could speak on B2C with yeah. money. Like it's easy to say, yeah, businesses have money, so you should move up market and go enterprise or whatever, but there are consumers out there with money. Can you talk to that a little bit? So what you're looking for, this market must have number five that we discovered. It's not necessarily selling to millionaires or billionaires or um, businesses that have deep pockets. It's selling to people who have demonstrated they're willing to spend a disproportionate amount of their income in that area of their life. So in the hobby markets like orchids and permaculture and things like that, you want to look at what is the barrier of entry into that market? How much money are people investing in that area of their life? your pricing should be a derivative of that. Let's take two extreme examples. So on one hand, you could be in the chess market. How much money is involved to learn and play the game of chess? Well, you and I could buy a chess board for 20 bucks at Walmart. Heck, we could go to the park and probably pay, play chess for free with the park tables that are, you know, with the built-in chess. There's not a whole lot of money required to make chess work. Compare that to a market like golf. Think about the thousands of dollars that people spend in the golf market to get your clubs, equipment, golf vacations, golf trips, uh, uh, trips to the masters, private lessons, private instruction. People spend exorbitant amounts of money on the game of golf. Just a single round of golf could be hundreds of dollars, more money than someone might spend in their lifetime playing chess. So the type of market you're in, you can look at, is there evidence that people spend a high percentage of their income in that area of their life. And your pricing can be a residual from that. So in this respect, orchids is kind of like a yellow light for this particular factor, right? Because orchids is something that people might spend hundreds of dollars a year on that hobby, but chances are with, with the exception of a few extremists, they're not spending thousands of dollars a year in that, in that hobby for their life. So um, you wanna be thinking about that as you choose your market and choose the um, the, the, the subject that you're thinking about building your course around. Yeah, I think that's, so, that's, so Chris, I'll tie it, I'll turn it back to you. I'm curious. Yeah. 
we went through the five market must-haves. Yeah. I, I could tell you were taking some notes. You're yeah. thinking about the permaculture market. Um, let's go, go through them one by one. How do you think that the permaculture market fares? So start with uh, evergreen market. What do you think? Is it check the box? Yeah, a lot of people are teaching the same stuff they taught in the 70s. <laughs> so, Perfect. So yeah. it checks off the evergreen box. What about yeah. enthusiasts? People stay consumers in this market for years and years and years? It's a lifestyle. Perfect. So it's a forever thing, right? Um, what about urgent problems? Is there, an, what's an example of an urgent problem that gives you that niche doorway that you can solve in that uh, market? Is there one that comes to mind? Yeah, there's, there's an obvious one. The doorway is I just bought a piece of property or I finally got a more, more I'm, I've got my land, you know, so there's this blank canvas. That's the doorway. And I would be thinking about what was it that makes that urgent? Is there a window of opportunity? Is there, you know, so, so a brief opportunity? Maybe there's some seasonality, right? Maybe depending on where, where people are living, they have to break ground and take action before the winter months come around. And so there may be some cyclicality to this business. Um, what about future problems? So you, you, you get into that market and what are, the, what are some of the future problems? I mean, there's lots of them. I mean, you can, I mean, you can literally like, uh, transform like a desert and like you can reverse desertification in some climates. Uh, you can, you can always improve. I mean, you can, the whole idea of permaculture is, is it's another level beyond sustainable. It's not lit just like, how do we keep things together? How do we keep making things better over time? So there's a never ending regenerative, like things you can do both on your land or in your community or in the world at large. It just keeps going out. So. There's a philosophy baked in to the niche that implies that you're constantly improving, you're constantly doing things. So with that, there's the implication that there are constantly new levels, new challenges to solve. So it checks that box. And what about PWMs? Are we selling to broke people? Are these just a bunch of broke hippies that are moving out into the middle of nowhere? We got people with money to spend on our stuff. What do you think? I think that's the counterintuitive one because this is a, somebody... You typically, you, won't, you may not find them in like a Main Street mall, but yep. they'll fly around the world, you know, spend $2,000 on a two-week workshop and they are getting some real estate. So there's money somewhere, you know, to make the land happen. So yes, it's counterintuitively, the market does have money. So. so it's sounding like that uh, at first glance, the market checks off the boxes on the five market must have. So in that case, if we're going through this process, I would say, good, let's give it a green light for this step, for this one step in the process, and let's move on to the next test. And we look at things like market size, we look at market competition, we look at the market mix, we look at who's already selling, who's making money, who's having success as kind of the next benchmarks to see, is this something that we go all in, that we pursue, um, or is it something that we maybe pivot or shift or rethink? Yeah, that's, um, that is super helpful. Um, I, wa I wanted to pivot a little bit to to uh, if we look at, <clears throat> I see a lot of people like kind of learn this stuff and then they, they stay inside marketing or entrepreneurship. But there's this whole world outside of marketing and entrepreneurship, like what we're talking about here with plants and permaculture or parenting or hobbies. I, I was just curious if you notice that, that sometimes people stay, they, they forget that they have all these other passions and, and they're, that are often a lot less competitive because the people in there aren't also entrepreneurs and marketing and business people. Do you, could you speak to that issue at all? Just like the opportunity out there? Well, I think it goes back to your uh, five hats challenge, right? Yeah. Is we live in a world where uh, increasingly um, we need to uh, uh, think about wearing one of those hats as our dominant hat. Yeah. Uh, we're talking before we got on the show about how difficult it is to try to do it all on your own. Yeah. Um, I'm often asked if I could start all over again and knowing what I now know, the wisdom that I have, you know, when I first started my business, my goal was to make $10,000 a month in passive income. That was like my yeah. big someday maybe goal. Uh, last year, a little over 10 years later, we just passed $10 million across our businesses. And uh, in that journey, I've learned a lot of things. In the first few years of my business, we tried to do everything ourselves. When I say we, me and my wife, we did everything. We were, you know, we would spend late nights with takeout, uh, Netflix playing in the background. We would be packaging books and DVDs, putting labels on them, driving them to the post office ourselves. We did everything ourselves. So we wore all the hats. So I totally get it for anyone who's at that stage right now where you're, you know, writing your copy, creating the course, getting on camera, doing the, you know, doing this thing, <laughs> yeah. doing the tech job, answering yeah. customer service, you know, like all of the things. I totally right. know what that's like. Um, 
But we want, I've learned along the way that I am like, as we've grown our business, I have a, a company now with about 60 employees. And yeah. so I'm doing fewer and fewer and fewer jobs where once I was doing all of the things. And I think when you talk about what you're describing right now is at some point we have to kind of make this decision, which is, am I going to try to be a jack of all trades and maybe limit the growth of my business? Or am I going to specialize in one of these hats? Am I going to become a technologist? in which case build a team of people who have expertise in these other areas. Am I gonna be the expert? Am I gonna be a world-class expert in this one topic and be the person who speaks on camera, maybe supported by a team of technologists and course creators and others that help support me? Um, am I gonna be the course creator? Am I gonna do frameworks and, and write co content and, and, and create curriculum? Is that my thing? Um, as we grow, you have to increasingly specialize if you want to ascend. That's, uh, that's my belief. It's been my experience, certainly. Um, so I think the question is, what do you want to do? Like, what kind of life do you want to create for yourself? There's no right or wrong answer. Um, I do know that there are different, um, uh, there's a different pay scale associated which, uh, with which of these you want to um, pursue. And I think a lot of people choose the marketing and sales path because that's the one that provides unlimited income potential. That's the one that gives you the ability to, um, you, know, you know, you get to write your own ticket. You get to decide what your paycheck is going to be with no ceiling to that. Um, you know, in the orchid space, there are a lot of broke orchid experts who uh, relish at the opportunity to work with a business like ours because they have all this expertise. They just don't know how to monetize it. So Yeah, you'll pay me $1,000 to write a, a a long piece of content or make a course for you. Like I'm stoked. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you can imagine, right. Cause it's, it's an opportunity to, to share your knowledge with the world. So um, I think that's, that's a predominant driver. Now what's for me at my stage where I feel like, um, you know, had this methodology, developed this methodology, um, have done it in all these different markets. Um, I'm at a stage now where my kids are starting to get involved in our business. And this is kind of where circle of life comes around where I've made the decision to be an educator, to be a teacher, to serve entrepreneurs, my favorite people in the world. I love working with entrepreneurs. I feel like entrepreneurs are put on this planet to change the world. And to be able to work with people like that is like the best thing in the world. So I love working with entrepreneurs. That's my who. I talk about in the book, the importance of choosing not what you're going to do, but who you're going to serve. Entrepreneurs are my who. Um, I wouldn't have it any other way. My kids are at an age though now where they're looking at different things and we're trying to get them involved in the business in different ways. And we've started to talk with them about building perhaps a niche business in one of several areas where they get to learn the ropes. They get to put this all together and build courses and do videos and all the things that we do in this space that has nothing to do with how to make money or do business or anything like that. So I think there is a season of life that makes sense for all of us to revisit those questions and decide, do you want to go into one of these quote unquote less competitive niches, taking everything that you've learned from, you know, uh, implementing your software, what you teach, what you talk about, and then building a business way outside the marketing or sales or business space that maybe is a passion or a passion of, uh, you know, someone in your family that's really important to you. I love that. I like how you position it as it's not a one size fits all. It depends on your strengths and what do you want to be? Um, totally. And who do you want to surround your with, surround yourself with, and and what what adds the most value? Um, what we we have people using our software who are advanced like you, and I'm curious as a as your own expert who's chosen to serve entrepreneurs, what what is it that you hold on to in terms of roles or duties in your company? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's this there's this fascinating dilemma that happens when you grow a company, and that's this. Um, the thing that the founder tends to be strongest at is the area of the business that has the biggest weakness because that's the area that you've relied on the founder or founders for so many years. So you find that that's where the gaps usually emerge. Um, and so for me, those are some of the places that I'm still uh, involved in in a big way. So areas that I'm, involved, that I'm involved in in a big way. Number one, uh, in many ways, I am part of the product. I'm not the product, but I am part of the product. I'm the spokesperson. I'm here. We're doing this interview right now. Um, it's my name on this book, even though you know, it takes a village to write a book like this. Um, uh, my name is the name on the front of this book. I'm doing the interviews. I'm on camera. I'm doing a lot of the teaching. I'm the face of our business. Um, but we're, uh, we're shifting that. Uh, we're, we're moving a lot more toward a faculty model where we're bringing in other experts, um, some of whom uh, were born out of our community. 
You know, people who read my first book, Ask, built a business around it, and now they're coming in and they're now teaching how they've done things that are far more innovative than anything that I've created or come up with. So, um, so there's that. Um, I'm still heavily involved in the, uh, the marketing, right? So um, our marketing uh, uh, at a strategic level, what campaigns are we running? What are the big ideas? Um, what are the hooks? What are the campaigns? What are the, uh, the big promotions that we're running? I'm still involved in that. Um, and I'm very much involved in the, uh, the strategy. There's a model that we run the company on that I think that will be very interesting for anybody who's ascending in your business, and it's called Rocket Fuel. Rocket Fuel is a book uh, written by Gina Wickman. Um, anyone not familiar, basically the model is that every business has what's called a visionary and an integrator. Visionary is the person who uh, oftentimes gets a lot of the credit. Um, oftentimes it's the person who has the big ideas. They are the one speaking on stage. They are the chief salesperson in the company. Um, the integrator is the one who runs the day-to-day -day operations of the business. And we run that, our business on that model. My, my business partner, my integrator, Richard, um, he you know, runs the day-to-day -day operations of the company. I actually don't have any direct reports. So I don't have anybody who reports into me. I sort of orbit the team. So we have, you know, Richard, our integrator, who's our COO, chief operating officer, our senior team all reports into him and their teams report into them. But I'm just a moon sort of orbiting the planet where I pop in as almost like a highly paid consultant whenever we have an area of the business that needs support or help. Um, and I get to be kind of the chief creative and, um, you know, uh, uh, creator behind a lot of the new initiatives that we, um, that we put out there. So that's not the only way to do things, but to answer your question, that's how my role has evolved. From the early days when I was the one writing HTML, writing CSS, building the website, you know, writing the book, all that stuff, um, a lot's changed since those early days. So we're recording this in the spring of 2019. Can you just throw a timeline out there? Like when was Scrabble Tile Jewelry? When, was, when, did, you, when did the integrator, uh, Richard, join, join you on the journey? And then to today, like just, just give us a timeline because I'm sure this took a while to play out. Yeah, it didn't happen overnight. So if I look back at the timeline, the Scrabble Tile thing happened 2000, 2007, 2008. So about 12 years ago. Yeah. Um, the Orchid business happened 2008, 2009. I think the memory business, our next one is in 2010. And then we started knocking out these niches one right after the other. Um, I wrote the book Ask four years ago is when I kind of shared the story of how um, I entered all these different niche markets. Um, and then two years ago, two, gosh, three years or two years ago, two to three years ago is when Richard came on board. Um, and, uh, I think it was two years ago was when we first landed on the Inc 500 list of the fastest growing companies in America and, and landed on it for the second year, um, uh, last year as well. So, you know, all said and done, it's been a, you know, about a 12 year journey to get from, you know, the early state, quitting my job, um, yeah. making no money, going broke, uh, in my first business, uh, to, uh, where we are here today. And it's not a straight line. Like, it's not like people think it's just the straight line. I mean, there's, you know, ups and then they're downs and it's a bit of a roller coaster. And I think uh, if I've learned anything, it's that um, one of my mentors shared this with me. He said, Ryan, it's never, um, it's never as good as it seems, but it's also never as bad as it seems either. So we're on this roller coaster as entrepreneurs and there are days where it feels like, you know, the sky is falling. Why am I doing this? I'm going to give up. Like, I just got to do this, you know, do whatever I was doing before or whatever. And there are other days where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to take over the world. And I yeah. just kind of learned that the truth is always somewhere in between. It's always somewhere in between and just to kind of take everything in stride. That's awesome. Uh, well, I have one quick question for you about ask before we sign off. Okay. Um, there's just something I'm noticing in the industry and as an entrepreneur, I'm a big fan of pre-selling validation, getting outside the building and talking to people. One of the things I notice in my Facebook group and other Facebook groups and social media areas is I'm seeing a dramatic increase in people that are, out there validating as new entrepreneurs and stuff like that, which is great. But what I often see is um, people come in hot and heavy, new member of the group, and immediately like, I'm thinking about doing this, PM me. In your opinion, like, how do we, if we're gonna be out in our market trying to figure out our who and talk to them and feel what their problems are, what's the best way to kind of open a conversation to get into a, an ask flow? Like, what's the, um, like what's the, how, how do you enter into that if, if you're going outside of your audience? It's a great question, right? Because it's sort of like, you know, sometimes we forget when we're online how to be a human being. Okay. It's like you go <laughs> online and it's like you do the equivalent of meeting someone for the first time and you say, hi, my name is Ryan. Can you tell me? How much money is in your bank account? Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you need? Yeah. It's like, 
<laughs> Calm down. Let's get to know each other a little bit. Um, and I think people do the equivalent online. They, they want to get right to it, right? And I think we live in this world of immediate gratification. What was it? Is it Carrie Fisher who said that immediate gratification takes too long? Uh, and it's like this idea that like even when something happens immediately, it's still like, you know, people's expectations are it should be faster than that. Um, and so I would take a step back and think about what would a human do? Like what would a normal human being do um, in a, to develop a relationship online? So that's the philosophy. Let's bring that down to something actually tactical that we can do. So if you join a new Facebook group and uh, you're trying to understand the market, number one, start by listening, right? So uh, I think it's an, it's an, it's a, an underrated skill that sometimes we forget um, that just sit there and listen, right? Imagine you're in this new group, you're sitting in the middle of Times Square and you're just looking around. You're just walking by the, walk, watching the people walk by you. You're listening, eavesdropping on, on conversations. Just do that for a little bit. You're going to learn a ton. You're going to learn about the tenor of the group, the cadence of the group. Spend a little time just kind of soaking it all in. Once you've done that, then a great tactical uh, uh, approach that you can use in that group is to use is the, the technique I describe as, is, does anybody else experience this? So let's say you're in a group with new parents, right? Um, and you want to understand that market. Um, is anybody else's uh, kid just not sleeping through the night? Is it just me? Yeah. And what you're going to find is one of two things is going to happen. Either A, people are going to pour on that post and be like, oh my gosh, like that is so me. Like, yes, I totally identify with that. Or you're going to get crickets. If you get crickets, that's a data point. It tells you that's, you haven't struck a nerve. You haven't hit a hot button. That isn't something that um, has really you know, resonated. But if you do it out there, it's a low threshold way that's not... Um, you know, slimy or scammy or, you know, like, Hey, I'm thinking about creating this thing. It's just asking, is anybody else like struggling with this? And ideally it's something that you've authentically observed or noticed yourself, right? Anybody else's orchid just like suddenly lose its blooms one night. Like, I don't know why this happened, but is it just me or is this happened to anybody else? Right. And if you get people saying like, Oh my gosh, that happened to me. Here's a photo. Let me talk. That opens the door for you to then say, you know, Hey, Tammy, um, what kind of orchid is that? Oh, it's a blank blank orchid. You start a conversation. And then if you hit it off with someone, then you can take that conversation to, hey, do you mind if I PM you? I had a few questions that I was hoping I might ask you. Is that cool? And then you PM them and then you take it into a conversation. But you want to do it in an organic way. You don't want to do it in a way that is just, you know, join a group, five minutes later say, you know, when it comes to growing orchids, what's your biggest challenge? And you're like, oh gosh, like, <laughs> yeah. oh. like you've, you've, you've bastardized the whole process. It's like be a human, ask questions, but do it in a way that is natural and authentic. I love it. Ryan Levesque, choose the book.com forward slash LMS cast. I'm going to go get that right after this call. Um, I have one final question for you, Ryan. Before I, there's this problem that course creators, coaches, consultants have is course creators specifically is they go in what I call the course creation cave. That's where, and I see it. Sometimes they're in there for months, even a year, even multiple years. Um, and then they come out and it, the, the launch doesn't go well. It doesn't work. Before they go in the course creation cave and commit to just pouring their heart and soul into the program or the course or the content, what advice do you have for them? So I would recommend that you follow a model that uh, we've used. It's something that I call the Skittle method. And it stands for screw it, do it live. Now, the Skittle <laughs> method is very simple. You come up with the five or six big topics that you want to talk about in your course, and here's what you do. You pre-sell it before you've created a single one. People sign up for your course. And then what you say is this. Next week, I'm going to be teaching the first module. Before I do so, I want to make sure I'm covering what you want to hear covered. Would you tell me, when it comes to XYZ topic, what's your biggest question or challenge you'd like for me to focus on? Then that's the outline of your first module. When you're finished with that first module, after that, you ask people, you say, hey, is there anything you were hoping that I would cover or talk about that maybe I missed? I'll make sure to incorporate that in the next module. Then you use that to, just, to, to define your next module. You do it live. You're not creating anything ahead of the time. Now, if we look at this book, Choose, that's exactly what I did. I did five iterations. I taught the course, the taught the framework that I teach in the book five times to five different cohorts of people every single time using this process, refining it, adapting it, and getting it to a place where I was answering all the questions, removing all the uh, uh, challenge that people ran into, and then and only then did it get packaged up into a book that's gonna live forever. Don't try to write the book before you've gone through this process. So use the Skittle method, screw it, do it live, get feedback from your audience, ask the right questions, and uh, go out there and change the world. 
Wow. So many, uh, so many jewels of wisdom there. I really appreciate it, Ryan. Go get the book at choosethebook.com forward slash LMS cast. Thank you so much, Ryan, for coming on the show. We'll have to do it again sometime. Awesome, Chris. It's been a pleasure and uh, absolutely. Let's chat soon. And that's a wrap for this episode of LMS cast. I'm your guide, Chris Badgett. I hope you enjoyed the show. This show was brought to you by Lifter LMS, the number one tool for creating, selling, and protecting engaging online courses to help you get more revenue, freedom, and impact in your life. Head on over to lifterlms.com and get the best gear for your course creator journey. Let's build the most engaging results getting courses on the internet. Mm -hmm.